uh, and we are live. So, um, hello everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. A very warm welcome to the session nine of day five, the last session of today, of the third international conference and the Pop Festival for Youth Led Climate Action 2021. We are delighted to have you all join us for one of the biggest youth-led events for climate action. My name is Drisha Pathak. I'm a public health professional and a pop youth mentor at the pop movement. The pop family is excited to welcome you to the session, which will focus on the topic climate justice. It will be, uh, there will be a keynote address by our two extreme important and uh, respected panelists, followed by a youth panel. Uh, where we'll, we'll have young people joining us from different parts of the world. In continuation of the youth panel that was conducted in April 23rd, 2021 with Global Minded, this session seeks to amplify the voices of personal experience about inclusive, just and equitable climate leadership co covering different regions of the world, such as North America, Latin America, Africa. Uh, with that... I would also like to put some key instructions before we start. Kindly keep your microphone switched off to avoid any background noise. Please feel free to use the Zoom chat to send in your questions or our facilitators will help us coordinate. And we would like to share with you our social media handles, which you can find in the chat along with the hashtag very specific to the festival and also the hashtag that you can use to put on the social media. Now, I would like to hand over the session to Summer Benjamin, who is a pop youth uh, ambassador from for, for Caribbean. Welcome, Summer. Thank you so much, Trisha. Um, welcome, everyone, again, uh, to this wonderful youth panel, which is Strategies for Inclusive, Just, and Equitable Climate Leadership. Uh, as Trisha said, my name is Summer Benjamin. I'm the pop youth ambassador for the Caribbean and a high school student at Preda Gruber International Academy in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Um, so this panel aims to amplify voices showcasing personal experiences about inclusive, just, and equitable climate leadership covering different regions of the world, such as North America, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa. So we have many regions represented. So I want to get started right away and hand the floor over to our very first keynote speaker, Miss Carol Carter from Global Minded. Carol, please take the stage. Thank you so much, Summer. And it's so wonderful to be here with all of you because at uh, the end of April, we launched, or the third week of April with Earth Week, we launched our 10-week conference, which we're in the ninth week of it this week. That's why it says Health Week. Um, with this amazing uh, group of people that is the, the pop community. And it was um, really inspiring. It was really insightful and um, such an opportunity to carry this work forward over time. So for those of you do, who don't know, I'll share just a little bit about Global Minded and who we are and what we do and what our vision is and um, the way in which we hope to really be able to inform and advance the work that, that POP does with our community. So we are all about creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, BIPOC, you know, any way you can define diversity is how we define it. And to get more of that much needed diversity into the education, economic mobility, and leadership pipelines. So not just you know, more people who are principals and superintendents of school districts, but more people who are on boards, more people who are in the C-suite of corporations, more people who are leading focus groups where everybody developing a product and technology is not all white male from privilege. You know, that we're really able to look at um, developing our practices and our companies and our nonprofits so that they look like the rest of, of the world that we're all a part of. And I know that that's really mission aligned with POP and the, and the really courageous ways that you all are talk, tackling a lot of the, the climate issues. So, so Global Minded um, achieves its goals in a few different ways. One of them is we have an annual conference. So that was part of what you all helped us launch this year during Earth Week. And 
it was virtual last year, it was virtual this year, but next year it's going to be in Denver, June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. So I want to invite like the whole pop community to join us and maybe we can, you know, in some ways, you know, marry part of your virtual with part of our actual, or we'll figure out, you know, some of the best ways to be able to combine resources there. Um, but that's kind of a big initiative of what we do each year. Then we have programs, leadership programs for students, students who are um, low income or first into college or diverse students to connect them to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs. And next week, I wanna invite all of you. We have our first gen um, and our leadership programs and they're at four o'clock Eastern time. Uh, for an hour every day next week. And there are incredible um, role models and people every single day. Um, we've got some of our graduates out of our programs um, starting on Monday. Um, uh, Dr. Alicia Sepulveda went on to get her PhD and she'll be leading the panel with some of our first gen students from this year um, who were part of our Every Learner Everywhere Ambassador Program. And then on Tuesday, we're going to be looking at the mentor-mentee relationship and how can students engage in really effective mentor-mentee relationships and how do you design the alliance? How do you let your mentor know, you know what your needs are? How do you keep, you know, kind of those professional timeframes, you know, twice a month or whatever it is you agree to? How do you uphold that and really learn through working with that mentor how you can mobilize to make real change happen, which is exactly what each of you are doing. And then how do you learn through that mentor relationship, how you yourself can also be a mentor for those who are a few years you know, behind you. So we're very fortunate that um, the Microsoft alums here have chosen us as their charity. So we're working with some of the Microsoft alums and they have a network that is global. So some of those people are in different countries around the world. We're working with some of the folks from Salesforce of, and people who are um, under 30 years of age. And then we're working with some incredible leaders in our leadership circle who went to Stanford Business School. And there's a whole group of them that have formed over a variety of years, starting with 1984, to really tackle equity issues. And so some of them are going to be the mentors. So we've got some really cool different kinds of people to influence young, young college students about what it's like to um, be successful as a professional, but also what it's like to just be able to um, persist in college and then to take on really big problems what, like what each of you are doing and then how to be effective joining arms and joining forces to be able to make that change. So that's kind of another, another piece of what we do is we do leadership for young people and we just be thrilled to work with the POP community for all of that. We're um, recording those sessions next week. So those will be posted on our YouTube channel and would love to share that widely with all the pop um, leaders everywhere, um, whoever could learn from that. Um, and then we've got a session next Wednesday called Where Are They Now? And several of our graduates who started with us like in 2015, 2016, all the places where they're working and their perspectives now as leaders and how they want to pay it forward now for the next generation. So that's next Wednesday and then next Thursday, um, the gentleman who is our connection to those Stanford alums is a, a man named, um, incredible man, Mr. Ken Epps and his father, his parents were both sharecroppers. So he's from very humble beginnings. He went to a historically black college, South Carolina State University. Then he went to Stanford Business School. He started three tech companies. He's all about giving back and he has business leaders who are first gen from all different backgrounds and they're sharing, you know, what's it like to be sort of, I say, middle age or better, you know, because I'm 58, but, you know, in my mind, I'm your age. So that's kind of, <laughs> I'm usually coming from the perspective of a 25 year old, but um, he has just some incredible leaders and they're the wisdom keepers for, you know, young people like you and they have a lot to share um, and they also have a lot to learn from from you all. So and then finally, next Friday, we're, we've got a session on first gen role models and people from all different industries, all different backgrounds. Um, so that's kind of our, our lineup. And we just invite all of you to participate in that next week. And then 
The next thing that we do is monthly, we do equity sessions and we have one <clears throat> for STEM, one for um, technology. We have one every month for health leaders one for K-12, one for higher ed. We have one for foundations and funders and they're free every month. They are communities of practice. And really what I'd love to do at some point, you know, Ash is set up like a, you know, a energy sustainability equity team. And then maybe quarterly or monthly, you know, we come together for different conversations that that community of practice can advance that work. So they're all led by people of color. Almost all the panelists are leaders of color. So if students are at a college and they are in England or they are in the US, whatever, and most of their faculty are white people, they can come to these sessions and go, oh my gosh, this is where all the diverse people are who are my role models. And they can see themselves you know, in, in these folks. So, um, and then finally we have um, some inclusive leader awards across 15 industry sectors and we really, you know, um, know that until those leaders are household names like movie stars and sports stars, we're not going to have the diversity and inclusion that we need to, the awareness, because we need to prioritize <laughs> what people are doing and how they do it, because that's how we all learn from each other. So that's kind of the, the last piece. And it's just, um, it's been really a wonderful hero's journey. I started this in um, 2014 and I started Global Minded because I had gone through a couple of years of treatment for lymphoma. And I was like, you know what? You need to do something big and give back in a big way. What's the biggest thing that you could see to do? And that's really how Global Minded started. So it's been really uh, amazing because there's just like thousands of people like Ash and each of you. And you just go, oh my gosh, these are such incredible people changing the world you know, in, um, in the most important ways. So that's probably like, I'll stop there. Cause I know it was supposed to be 10 minutes and I just saw I'm over by four minutes. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your incredibly amazing work. And I'm so glad that, um, this can be kind of the, the continuation of what we started in April with all of you. And now it's kind of, you know, 10x where it's all expanding. So thanks so much for allowing us to be a part of it. And we're just looking forward to walking on this path with all of you in so many different ways. So thank you for letting me be here and um, just be a part of your giant heart circle and the change makers that you all are, because it very much inspires me. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great what you're doing, creating more diverse representation and leadership roles and connecting youth to those mentors that are just like them. That's really important for sure. And your 10 minutes actually ended at 7.15, so you're totally in the time range. You did great. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you coming to speak here. Uh, so we're going to continue on to our second keynote speaker, who is Ms. Krista Cook from Solidarity, Solidarity Engineering. Excuse me, so if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead, please do. Hi, um, I'm Krista, nice to meet you all. Thank you so much for coming today and thanks for inviting us. Um, I was a co-founder of Solidarity Engineering and this is Hannah, she is a project manager. Um, can I go ahead and share my screen for the presentation? So yeah, the host is disabled. It says that the host is disabled participant screen sharing. Hold on one second. I think Drisha can go ahead and let me do that. Can you can you try now? Yes. Okay, um, I'm Krista. Hannah. Uh, where was Solidarity Engineering? Uh, so a principle for activism, solidarity with those who suffer inequity plays an essential role in the quest for environmental justice. Uh, so the effects of climate change are numerous, but generally climate change induces warming temperatures and unpredictable rainfall, which results in droughts and floods and more extreme weather events, including, including storm intensification. 
Uh, this graphic shows developing shows that developing nations are disproportionately affected by climate change, uh, despite wealthier nations being responsible for the majority of carbon emissions. Uh, so these climatic fence events result in increased pressure to migrate as crops are lost and economic hardships are exacerbated. Climate migration typically does not act in isolation, but compounds with other influences such as socioeconomic, demographic, and political factors. Uh, the problem tree here illustrates the connection between climate change and migration. Uh, generally speaking, climate change induced environmental changes create inhospitable conditions in places of residence that compound with other factors until the individual or families make the difficult decision to leave their homes. Climate change shown at the bottom there uh, has created a general warming trend in temperatures as well as shifted seasons, um, including wet and dry seasons that many regions experience and are dependent on for agriculture. The shifting seasons also shift seasonal, seasonal seasons, sorry, seasonal events such as cyclones and wildfires. Uh, these environmental factors are shown in teal at the bottom and both slow onset events such as drought and sudden onset events such as storms create inhospitable conditions. Drought and flooding cause loss in agriculture crops with which farmers and their families rely on for income. Um, these connections are shown in pink up above the teal. Uh, these communities economies, which are shown in green, um, and access to food are also dependent on agriculture. And with the loss of crops, they become unstable. Uh, there is a large trend of internal migration from urban areas, sorry, from rural, rural areas to urban areas um, in search of job opportunities and then the hopes of increased access to food, which is shown in orange. Um, however, urban areas can also expose these populations to violence and make, susceptible to, make them susceptible to persecution and discrimination as they experience more interactions with police, military, and cartel in cities. Uh, these interactions are shown in purple. Uh, there are also other political and social factors such as familial ties um, that influence where migrants decide to move. Some migrants decide to migrate internally, especially to urban areas, but may eventually migrate internationally. While others decide to migrate internationally from the start, which these um, are all shown in blue for international migration, but more than anything, this non-comprehensive diagram is meant to show that the relationships between climate change and migration are nuanced, but in every circumstance, the decision to migrate is complex and is not made lightly, especially as the migrant trail can be expensive and dangerous. As we discussed, climate change is linked to storm um, intensification and causes flooding and landslides. Two hurricanes that occurred in November of 2020, Hurricane Eta and Iota, exemplify this and, spur and spurred Solidarity's work in the Alta Verapaz region in Guatemala. Um, for reference, uh, you can see the photo on the right for where the Alta Verapaz region is in Guatemala, and it is a pre-Columbian times. This area was part of the Mayan civilization, and much of the rural population in this mountainous region still predominantly speaks their native languages. Um, hurricane Eta, a category four hurricane hit on November 3rd in 2020. Less than two weeks later, Hurricane Iota, Iota, which was a category five, hit on November 17th, causing flooding in the region. The government of Guatemala then declared a state of emergency in effect for 30 days in the Alta Vera Paz region after the hurricanes. This graph shows the climate change induced rapid intensification of these storms. Rapid intensification is defined as an increase in the storm's maximum wind speed that reaches or exceeds 35 miles per hour in 24 hours or less. When compared to the intensification or change in wind speed from the Atlantic hurricanes from 1851 to 2019, Hurricane Eta and Iota depict the increased intensity and frequency of storm events and, shifted, and shifting seasons that have been linked to climate change. Solidarity Engineering and our partner Global Response Management conducted a emergency response to these hurricanes in December of 2020. The following, the flooding caused a significant loss of infrastructure and clean water access points, as well made access to and from the villages themselves extremely limited. We conducted a water sanitation and hygiene or wash assessment in December, and then returned in March to distribute water filters, organize 
and hosted educational trainings for the filter use, conducted water quality tests, and conducted household surveys for impact assessments, and created maps of communities using ArcGIS collector and drone imagery. The photo on the right, you can see the extent of the flooding in Seseha, Guatemala. And this is a picture that indicates or demonstrates the landslides induced by the amount of water brought on from these storms. Um, another climatic influence in migration is in the region is intense drought. Uh, this drought that um, created the dry corridor began in 2009 during an El Nino event and has continued causing crop failures and food insecurity in the region. This has demolished the agriculture dependent economies and forced millions to migrate. migrate. It has severely affected the Central American nations of El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, and has been a large factor in many migrants' decision to move northward. Uh, so here is a picture of ear and corn on the left from a failed crop. Uh, and then the picture on the right is of migrants on, the, on top of a train called La Bestia, meaning beast. Um, and here are the routes, the northward routes through Mexico um, of this train line. Um, and Solidarity Engineering's work along the border takes place in the Northeast uh, region in Reynosa and Matamoros, Mexico. So regard displacement as yet another case of environmental injustice. Migrants are met with inhumane and harsh um, immigration policies and a militarized US-Mexican border that forced them to wait in, on the Mexican side of the border. Under the Trump administration's 2019 Migrant Protection Protocols, also known as the Remain in Mexico policy, the Matamoros camp opened. Uh, in the seven acre camp, which was located along the banks of the Rio Grande in the flood zone, we conducted flood analysis and response, implemented stormwater management practices to prepare the camp, developed a water filtration system, distributed tents and renovated the showers. In the picture on the bottom left, you can see some of the stormwater um, infrastructure that we installed to prevent the intense, uh, the intense um, aftermath of the floods. Um, there are sandbags to keep water from entering the tents, people's homes. The tents themselves are raised on pallets so water can flow under them. Many layers of gravel were added to allow water to pass through and, and also drainage ditches and canopies on top of the tents to prevent um, as much as possible, the impacts of the hurricane on the on the communities. Um, Hurricane Hannah hit the camp on July 25th, 2020. Although only a category one storm, it increased in intensity, intensity right off the coast before reaching land. It caused the Rio Grande to rise 12 feet in two days. And as basins drained upstream, the levels rose 24 feet in the next week. Our team provided migrants who have all their possessions and legal documents on them with trash bags to protect their documents and keep their belongings dry and established an emergency evacuation plan for the camp. The work I've discussed so far has been Solidarity's engineering work with the realm, within the realm of climate events. However, we're involved in several other projects as well. Um, to make the camp more livable, Solidarity Engineering constructed a school, a playground, and a soccer field. We also conducted electronic surveying to collect feedback on the work that we did within the camp. The Biden administration and Mexican authorities have closed the camp this February in 2021, resulting in overflow in the migrant shelters in Matamoros. Addition, additionally, the implementation of, of Title 42 has resulted in overflow of migrant shelters and formation of a camp in the plaza in Reynosa, Matamoros, in Reynosa, Mexico. Our um, focus along the border has shifted to these locations, providing improved shelters, um, wash facilities, that, again, that's water, sanitation, and hygiene, and education through our STEM classes. Um, we would like to say just thank you again for coming to our presentation. Um, and if you would like to contact us, please feel free to reach out on our website. We have a podcast on Spotify and you can use the QR code on the right if you'd like to learn more about the, the Guatemala project. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, and like I said, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Krista and Hannah, for sharing um, all the climate injustice that developing nations are facing. I am certainly familiar with hurricanes and the impacts that those have living here in the Caribbean. So I'm sure that they appreciate your help and it's great the work that you're doing. So thank you for presenting. Thank you. Um, so now we're gonna do a quick little interactive activity. 
Um, and this is for anyone here uh, on our Zoom who wants to participate. So uh, participants or panelists, anybody, keynote speakers, please feel free to join. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Let me see if I can. Okay, uh, Drisha, if you could um, allow me to share my screen, that would be great. And so this activity is called a Mentimeter and it is going to, here, let me share my screen. Okay, there. So it is asking for values that you believe promote equity, justice, and inclusion. Um, so the um, link in the chat, or you guys can go to the website at the top and use the code. Hang on one second. Let me just stop sharing really quick and share the um, link here. Okay, there is a link if you all want to put in some values that you believe promote equity. Okay, sorry, I'm just having some technical difficulties. But as you can see, some of the words that you guys put up here um, are creating a word cloud. So some of the words we have so far are empathy, respect, acceptance, solidarity, of course, tolerance, listening, gratitude, understanding. Nice, I really like these words, guys. Yeah, if you wanna keep adding uh, throughout the presentation, if you have any ideas, definitely go ahead. We can revisit this at the end of our presentation here. Collaboration, of course, important. Opportunities, definitely. So we can just watch the word cloud for a minute or two and see, and you have unlimited amount of words that you can add. So um, definitely have as many as you want. Community and kindness are really, really important words. Thank you guys. Um, so while we're waiting for the word cloud to up a little bit more, I'm just going to explain what we're going to be doing next. So we're going to be going into our panel uh, with all of our youth participants next. And what I'm going to ask you guys to do when you're introducing yourself is say a word that you put in the word cloud or one that you saw and why you think it's important just as a quick a uh, little sentence as you're introducing yourself. So let me stop sharing my screen and if you guys have a word, you can go ahead and go into our next segment. And we'll revisit the word cloud later for sure. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and go right into our youth panel. Um, so as I said, I'll ask you all to introduce yourself, just a brief introduction and one word that you put in the Mets meter or saw and why you think that's important. 
So if we can just go ahead and get started, Ricardo, if you want to introduce yourself briefly. So hi, my name is Ricardo Delgado. I'm 18 years old. I'm from Venezuela. I'm a journalist and a student. So it's a pleasure to be here. I want to turn on my light. <laughs> So that's it. I wrote respect because I think if we don't respect each other, how can we, how can we respect the earth? We first must to have understanding, tolerance, and respect with each other. So those were my words. Thank you. Respect super important. Thanks for sharing. Um, Zoe, if you want to go next, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, hello. I am Zoe Rivera. I am 15 years old. I am from Mexico. I'm very excited to be here. I do love these kind of spaces in where youth can share their pers perspectives and ideas. I think it's a very nice initiative that the pop movement and as well as Global Minded uh, made. And I wrote also respect because I believe that respect is a very important thing for building sustainable and better societies in where everybody can be included and taken into account. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So much for sharing. Uh, Fola, if you would like to go next, that would be great. Okay. Hello, everyone. So my name is uh, Fola Shade Malade. I'm the CEO of Future Savers Sustainable Development Initiative in Nigeria. and. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you. Um, Steph, uh, if you want to give a brief introduction and uh, a word that you put in, you put in a word. So hi everyone, my name is Steph and I am the 17 year old founder and director of Seas of Change Australia. Um, with this, we have a big focus on marine and environmental conservation, but um, also uh, youth empowerment. So some values that I added to the Mentimeter were collaboration and unity. I think this will lead to uh, more inclusive spaces. Um, and I'd just like to thank you for having me here today. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, next, I think we have Veer. Hi. Hi, everybody. First of all, so happy to be on the panel. Um, I'm Veer. I am from India, I'm the founder of Climate Action India and I fight for a range of national and regional climate action issues, um, some of which are the EIA draft, Ravadi Bajao, et cetera. Um, but um, the word I chose was empowerment. Um, and yeah, I chose the word empowerment, yeah. Empowerment, super important, thank you. And I think next we have Willie. I'm not sure if I saw him on the call. No, he's not there. Okay, no problem. Then I think that's everyone. Thanks guys for introducing yourself and sharing your Metsmeter word. Um, with that, we'll go right into our panel discussion. So I'm gonna give you guys around five minutes to answer each question, but don't stress if you go over or under, it's no problem. Uh, so our first question is for Ricardo. And it is, how can we create a global movement to achieve the goal of climate equity? So I'm going to try it a little bit fast. <laughs> I speak too much. Um, you know, summer in journalism, we study the way media influence in people and more recently how people influence media. I think we can extrapolate that into this topic because at the end of the day, the way to create a global movement is through influencing people, also acknowledged as inspiring. Right now, there, are, there isn't one general theory on communication, but thousands of theories about how they influence world through communication. So I must say that I find the human being a bit stubborn as the reason for these thousands and thousands of theories to exist is that as those genius communicators are trying to create a magnificent, unique general theory about how we communicate. Um, you know, uh, we are not even close to be for it to make it possible in the near future. We cannot generalize how we communicate, therefore we cannot generalize how we influence uh, or inspire others. We act 
everything and basically with the face on our needs. So our needs shape our reality as our needs are so different. So that's the way we react to others, to others' reality. And in this world, and um, between many realities, I want to make myself clear. I refer uh, when I say realities to causes, events, ideas, intention, movement, etc. So humanity isn't capable yet to create a movement as big as society itself. And that's not something bad. Uh, it just tells us that there are people who have different ideas and ours. And as long as there are people who think differently than us, we will always have um, a chance to improve our ideas and revaluate ourselves. So instead of focusing on creating uh, one only movement or only one movement, I will focus on encouraging the creation of many movements around the world. The, the results won't change that much as society is now to regulate the system. It will always find its way to expand and change. Movement remain in movement, so needs come and go. On the way, some movement will join other movement and other movement will eventually disappear. This is the way our society works. And so to gather all these various ideas, because this is a really extended topic, I want to share a few thoughts. First, to create a global movement to achieve the goal of climate equity. Uh, and any other goal is through influence. We must influence people. So I want to say all these people who are watching, who are here to these amazing young leaders, that you are ready to influence and make sure people are watching. People are always watching, but we must make sure of that. The main goal is to attract people, to empower people, to teach them to think critically, and to give them value. We live in a political system whose intention is not to make you think critically. OK, why? Because it's cheaper to buy the vote of a person who doesn't think than a person who thinks. This is the way I see it, and this is also the reason why some governments don't want to acknowledge climate change, or those who acknowledge, acknowledge it are not doing anything for it, because it's not economically profitable for a government, well, for a four-year period government to, you know, to accept such a big problem. So never ever forget to think critically and teach other people how to do so. I think that's a great way to start. And we have an amazing, uh, some amazing tools, which are mass media and social media. We have to take advantage of those ones in order to provide people from, uh, with knowledge. And remember, we the people have the power. We're just giving it to the wrong leaders. So that's my first thought. The second thought I have is that we have to be ready and you have to be ready for the thing we will find in our way. To change the world is not an easy path. You will find people who will be against your call and who still will be thinking that what's going on in the world is just, um, it's not real. You will find this kind of people even in the hidden, the most hidden spot in the internet and in the greatest sphere of power. So we have to be ready for that, we have to be prepared. Um, we don't, we, don't, uh, we can let that bring us down. You know, we have to remain resilient. And the more our causes may succeed, the more difficult our path or past will be. So we have to remain resilient. We have to do what we are doing. We have to uh, face our challenges with the best intention. And we have to, you know, to be in community. So I go from uh, with my third idea is that we have to unify our causes with another cause. It's no matter if you no matter if you are unifying your cause with neighbor to mow the lawn, or if you are a president helping other countries to, for development, union is what makes us stronger. We have to remain in community. We have to be in unity, and the only way 
for movement to or project to achieve expansion is through relations. So we have to take advantage of opportunities like this festival to connect with other people and to connect with as many people as we can. So for example, Summer send a message to Zoe and you know, start a conversation. That way both of you will be stronger. And that we have always to, to try to remain unified in unity and community because nobody wants people to unify. That's a reality. No, even the people who are um, in these greatest spheres of power who are not helping us, they don't want us to be united. So we have to remain in union, we have to remain in community. So I think that can make us stronger. And yes, of course, our culture may be different, but therefore here we are, auto-regulated by our society who decides somehow that our ways should intercross that our movement show intercross and my last idea my fourth and last idea for not to take any more time for you guys i speak too much i'm sorry uh i will share a quote that mr especially shared with me and it's a total life changer uh if my memory is working well i think he attributes this quote to his beautiful mother and it says that your intention, your emotion, and your attention are the most valuable things you can give to someone else. So that's it. Thank you. And that's what I want to share with you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. I totally agree that we need to take advantage of our social media resources and influence people and certainly create many different movements across the world that can work together in unison. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, so our next question will go to Fola. So this question is for you and it is, how are you aiming to bring biodiversity to life and how are you trying to implement climate culture and a sustainable lifestyle among the communities? Okay, thank you very much, Summer, for that question. And um, I think it's a question that best suits what um, Future Savers is doing currently in Nigeria. And um, basically, um, the mission of Future Savers Sustainable Development Initiative is to increase consciousness, sensitization, and public awareness on climate change. But uh, relating this to this particular question on bringing back biodiversity, I would like to say that um, for us, what we are doing in Future Savers, it's Future Savers, is that um, we are using the approach of um, catching them young because we believe that um, the older generation are kind of too stiff to all too yeah too stiff to be bended you know to be uh, bended over for them to actually start to accept you know um, how they should take care of biodiversity in the um, environment or how they can conserve the earth better. So we believe that um, it will um, start to go to the grassroots by. Um, informing children right from primary school and secondary schools about the importance of uh, biodiversity and putting this in their educational syllabus and uh, the need to really conserve you know um, environmental uh, endangered species that um, when these children or when these kids when they grow up they will actually um, be able to drive policies in the society that will you know favor um, the the protection of biodiversity and um, also actually favor policies that will you know um, make a better sustainable you know development or sustainable um, sustainable living you know in that particular community. So uh, basically, my solution to this particular uh, question is uh, going out there to the educational uh, facilities in individual, you know, individual countries, and then making sure that um, these climate related issues of uh, or um, organisms, uh, regions that are actually threatened because of climate change, you know, 
uh, really like uh, talked about in this particular, you know, schools and the teachers and lecturers, they have like the right knowledge so that they can disseminate the right knowledge to the scoopios and the children can grow up, you know, with the deliberate consent for, you know, uh, climate related uh, issues. I think, yeah, I think I've been able to answer that question. Oh, I yeah. don't have people to answer the question. <laughs> for sure, um, I, I totally agree. Um, teaching kids when they're young, catching them in primary and secondary education and um, explaining to them why it's important and why they should care about um, biodiversity, for sure. I, I totally agree that it's very, very important. Uh, so our next question is for Steph. Um, and this question is, how important is including indigenous knowledge and practices in environmental education to help ocean conservation? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so personally, I believe it is extraordinarily important to include indigenous knowledge and practices in ocean conservation work. I was lucky enough to speak at my state's Department of Education last month to share my family's Indigenous story and also give my opinions on how the department could better include Indigenous voices and provide a better learning environment to Indigenous people. This is a topic that I feel very passionately about. Um, so to begin with, First Nations cultures were here for so much longer before colonisation and they know and understand their country better than we could ever hope to. However, unfortunately, this knowledge has consistently been devalued by colonisers, resulting in the current unsustainable use of our Earth's resources. For our oceans, we are facing an ecological crisis due to overfishing, climate change, pollution, drilling, the list goes on. We are now at a stage where reversing these effects is imperative for the health and safety of future generations. And Indigenous people have this incredible knowledge about how to help our how to help protect our oceans, yet they are still facing challenges to have their knowledge and voices heard and valued. Western culture is so fo focused on researching without realizing that the knowledge base is already there, we just need to listen. We are so lucky that this shift is finally beginning to happen, but it needs to continue to happen so much more. Um, an example of this was in Australia where I live. We were um, ravaged by terrible bushfires early last year and we did not have the skills to adequately manage this crisis or to preempt this crisis. Um, yet we have now started to listen to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who have brilliant techniques to manage these bushfires. And we are really looking forward to better, more inclusive practices being used to avoid this destruction in the future. In addition, our natural environment is highly valued by Indigenous cultures. And this knowledge is so valuable to be used in environmental education to help everyone better connect to Indigenous cultures, but also provide Indigenous people with a greater voice that is so necessary in this westernized world. Moreover, Indigenous people were living in harmony with the nature before colonizers um, existed. And we should be giving First Nations people a platform to share these practices to better conserve our oceans and all work together for a more inclusive practice. So I hope that answers the question and that this will maybe spark others to consider um, how to better include Indigenous cultures and practices in their work. That certainly answered the question. It is so important to have Indigenous voices represented and um, I agree with what you said uh, about that Indigenous people already having the knowledge base and they already have the knowledge about the land and how to preserve it. So thank you so much for sharing your opinions and thoughts. Um, we're next gonna go on to Veer. So this question is, what approach did the youth you represent take to advocate for the conservation of the Averill Hills? Averill, sorry if I'm pronouncing that Aravali. wrong. Aravali, that's okay. It's uh, it's called Aravali. So uh, the Aravali range is a mountain range in India, which is the oldest fold mountain range we have. It's older than the Himalayas. Um, and um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, why we're saving the Aravalis. Um, so this is the mountain range which divides um, the desert land in India from the really fertile plains, um, which, uh, and we are an agrarian eco economy. So these are the mountains which block the desert winds from blowing over, um, over the northern half of India and uh, leading to intense uh, desertification and uh, deplete depletion of the water table, air pollution, etc. Um, so um, these hills were have been protected since 1900 by a bill called the PLPA 
ACA or which is the Punjab Land um, Preservation Act, um, which has um, you know uh, which has kept uh, land builders and property dealers and real estate development from uh, taking over the hills and uh, constructing um, uh, well constructing communities there. Um, so. Um, this PLP has had been amended in 2019, in February of 2019, this had been amended and it put, uh, essentially put an entire mountain range at risk of being um, exposed to real estate development and it could literally change the geography of the country. Um, and and Delhi is already one of the most polluted cities in the world, it's uh, where I am, I'm, I live in a suburb of Delhi. Um, so therefore, um, uh, that's how I got involved with the Aravali Bajao movement. I uh, read about this, and there was a there were a few citizens' protests that were happening, um, and that's how I got involved. Um, now, uh, the youth came into the movement um, because uh, I feel like what tends what has happened in the last um, maybe five years or six years is that um, the youth gets more uh, eyeballs, so to say, when they're put on a poster of a campaign, right, or when they are the face of a campaign. And what I feel tends uh, had happens in many places around the world, um, and and I feel like in the last two three years the youth has really fought against it. Is that um, uh, the youth become proxies for strong-willed adults um, in order for them to um, uh, push their campaign forward and try to um, again get more eyeballs. Um, so I when I entered the uh, uh, the movement to save the Aravalis, I felt that it was really important for the youth to have their own voice. Uh, and know what they were talking about when they spoke about a movement and uh, not just be poster uh, boys and poster girls for the uh, movement. Um, so that's when I founded Climate Action India. Um, and our sole purpose was to um, help um, children our age, I, I was 15 at the time, um, to help children our age um, try and find, um, firstly, understand uh, climate issues, understand where they're coming from, uh, local and regional climate issues, issues first um, and then uh, understand how to talk about them learn how to talk about them and try to um, try to advocate for them in the best way that they could um, given their own inputs um, right so the, so that they could given their own in inputs and were not uh, uh, dictated what they had to do uh, via others so we found a climate action India and our first focus uh, so first, we brought Fridays for Future uh, to India. We were the first, uh, one of the first protests for Fridays for Future in India. And, um, and then we focused on majorly, one of our biggest fights has been the Aravalis. Um, so we've done, a, a, firstly, I, I feel that the youth has um, more passion um, for, uh, to fight for whatever they believe in. Um, and we've seen that in a, over a range of um, you know um, movements and um, and uh, protests that have happened for different reasons across my country uh, in the last two years, um, and I feel that's been the biggest asset uh, of uh, my that's been my biggest contribution and the youth's biggest contribution to the Arabic uh, movement. Um, and uh, the second thing I feel is that um, because uh, we uh, I come from a country where um, most of the people are below the age of thirty five. So just in terms of sheer numbers, we have so many young people. So when they raise their voice for something, it tends to become very difficult for the people in power to, um, to resist or uh, to ignore it, uh, so to say. So uh, I feel that the youth has been really important in bringing uh, a certain level of credibility to the movement to, uh, uh, to allow people to acknowledge it. Um, and, and I think it's been the biggest driving force because it's ultimately us who's going to be dealing with the policy changes that happen right now. Um, it's uh, the people in power right now, well, they're on their way out. Um, you know, they are not going to be around in the next 20 years, but when my city will turn into, um, uh, will turn into a barren, uh, barren uh, land where, where it will be difficult for me to get water, even more difficult for me to breathe uh, freely, um, I'm going to have to deal with that. They won't. So I feel that the biggest asset of having the youth, especially on climate issues, uh, having the youth fight for a cause that they believe in, is that, um, is that they know uh, that they, they are, um, they are directly affected by it more than the people in power uh, currently are. So I think that's how the youth was, uh, youth was uh, instrumental in the Aravadi, saving the Aravadis. I hope that answered your question. 
Yeah, it's it's so great that you've been able to help youth have their own voices and not uh, just representing the voices of other people in power, because, of course, it will become our world more in the future. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and so with that, our final question for our final participant, uh, Zoe, is how can vulnerable populations, indigenous people and minorities have more participation at the local, national and global level? Oh, thank you. Well, I believe that the first step we need to do is to recognize the rights because as minorities or as diverse groups, uh, we do not have a, our human rights uh, sometimes ensured and sometimes they are not, we are not allowed to do certain things or to say or do certain actions. For example, myself, I am a openly gay pe person so in my school, uh, I wasn't allowed to say who I was, and that was uh, that didn't allow me to express myself in a correct way. So I believe that in order for us to ensure participation and representation of minor minority groups, we must ensure the rights. Because if we don't do it, how do we intend them to feel in the security of saying what they want, saying what they feel? So I think that if we protect the rights and if we treat them as people, as normal people, I think we could go further and we could build a better society. Um, I don't have a so long answer uh, as the other panelists because it's as simple as that to ensure the respect of human rights of the minorities. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so important. We definitely need to recognize the rights of our vulnerable populations because everybody needs to have a voice moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, so that is uh, the, all of our questions for our panelists. We do have one for everyone, just the same one. Uh, and that is, as a youth climate leader, how do you think inclusion of youth and global leaders can create equitable climate leadership? So if anybody wants to go first, uh, you can either raise a hand or unmute. Um, unless uh, nobody wants to go, then we can just start at the beginning with Ricardo. No, I, I can go first. That's not an issue. Um, yeah, so I think that what I said while I was talking about um, saving the Arabides, um, I think that uh, that I think that that holds true here as well. I think that the youth are perhaps um, the most affected by climate issues because uh, it affects a larger part of their life going forward. Um, I think that that's a big, big reason why they contribute so much to the to the climate movement and also um, uh, globally, not just in India. I spoke about India, of course, because I was speaking with reference to uh, um, saving the Aravalis, um, but uh, protecting the Aravalis, but, um, but a, a large part of the world population is, uh, is younger. Uh, the largest part of the world population is is um, is what we today call the youth, um, and therefore I believe that uh, that if you have the youth supporting a climate movement, um, just if if you look at the mathematics of it, um, uh, it's far more uh, likely to blow up uh, and uh, to uh, to uh, get attention from the people who are making uh, the decisions for them. Yeah, youth certainly are at the forefront of this movement. Um, Ricardo, I saw your hand up. If you want to go ahead, you can. Oh, yes. Sorry, my line of time and my signal is a little bit messed up. I don't know if you can hear me right. A well. So, this question. Um, one day there was a Latin American panel that discussed uh, somehow this topic. So I will try to make some reference about that session because it's such valuable information and I agree totally with them. So during the session, it was said that we are facing an intergenerational dilemma where adults think they do lacking experience and where we think the adults are lacking in action. I think the best example of this prayer is Red Lumber, and she expressed during a document of her life saying that the elder leaders uh, are not taking 
her seriously, but using her as a way for propaganda. I think the youth have new perspectives to put on the table of discussion, and we are not being considered by all leaders, more specifically, or political leaders. We are the ones who, in a couple of few years, will take the lead of our countries, and yet we are here being part neglected by our current leader. Um, I think it was uh, Carol Moreno, a uh, public leader, and uh, she said on Monday that I'm not the future, I'm the present, because I won't wait until I'm 13 years old to make a change. So that's something we all should be. Uh, thanks for sharing, Ricardo. I'm not sure if you were, you cut out or you were finished, but yes. All right. I think my signal. Um, do you guys can you hear me? Also, I think my signal is failing. We can kind of hear you are cutting in and out a little bit. Okay. Okay. So this girl, uh, Carol Moreno, she said that. She is not the, we are not the, the future, we are the present because we're not going to wear until we are 30 years old to make a change. And that's something we also keep to ourselves. So I think you'd have too much to give and we are not asking for anything else but the chance to prove ourselves and to speak up what is not being spoken. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, that is a very powerful quote that youth are the present, not the future. We can do something now. Um, is there uh, anybody else who would like to answer that question? I can just say it. I think oh, yeah. I'll just make so. Just a new thing yet. Uh, as much as we are youth, and um, I think um, mostly people have this, um, how do I put it? Most people have this ideology about youth that they can be very reckless, but uh, in our individual communities, I think we should like be like the real, uh, the right role models, you know. We should actually like display like real leadership. People should be able to say that, oh, she's young, is young, but you know, um, is like a good model, is a good example, is like, um, is whatever he says is really practicing it. For example, if you're saying that you're advocating against climate change, then people should really see that you are not actually contributing to uh, the issues of climate change. That is whatever you say, whatever you're defending, make sure like you really like practice it. People should say it, be the right model, be the right example. When people are saying that all the youths are really reckless, say no, it's not every youth. And they can find that you are really like a passionate uh, and a consistent person. That's all I want to add. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I think, oh yeah, Zoe, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would only like to share a short phrase that I liked a lot and that I do love to share with everywhere I go. So is here it is young men and women everywhere, and proclaim it far and wide. The earth is yours, and fullness thereof. Be kind, but be fierce. You are needed now more than ever before. Take up the mantle of change, for this is your time. Um, it's a phrase that Winston Churchill said, and I do like it a lot because it inspires you, and it demonstrates how important you are right now and the importance of us to take the leadership of these movements. So a little bit answering to your question, I believe that if governments and youth, uh, well, government and youth play a very important role. So if we united, we could make a lot of things, we could make amazing things. So there are governments around the world. I like to put my state as an example. In my state, fortunately, a youth and government work together and we develop projects and we develop the 2030 agenda in our state so it's a very amazing thing and it's an example that youth and government can work together to build a more sustainable future so here i like to make a little bit call for all governments to take action and to consider youth 
in your action and in your political agenda because we are the ones that will live in the planet when you live so it's very important for us to also take part of this kind of developing public policies and to take part of our future so thank you Thank you, youth and government working together, that should definitely be the way of the future. Um, and I think our last panelist to answer is Steph. Uh, I see you raising your hand, so please go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, I had to wait for the noise to die down outside of my school. Um, so I think being a youth climate leader is really, really important because youth, value, youth voices and their opinions are so, so valuable. And to create equitable change, it is imperative to include all voices, and that does include youth. Age really should not be a barrier to us um, and our life experiences should not be devalued. Whether you are 17 or 50, we still experience part of life. We still have those experiences change us and shape how we see our world. Um, and as I thought Via touched on really, really well, you should not be used as a show pony for others in this movement. We have our own voices and we deserve to have a say on policies that will affect us and our children most. And we should not just be put forward as that face of the movement for um, someone else to control. Seeds of Change's motto is that youth are 25% of the future of the population, but we are 100% of the future. And that is why including youth leaders in climate change discussions is so, so important because it is actually our future. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very well said. Of course, age should not be a barrier. We have our own unique experiences that we can share and our own knowledge to impart on everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, that is at the end of our panel. We finished a little bit early. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. And I'm going to pass it off to Ash for some final words. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to convey my gratitude to everyone who's who's been on the panel and also among the, the group that's uh, been listening in and sharing, you know, reactions and thoughts throughout. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's it's really I think all of the points that you guys have brought up are so important. And it is a time for us to take action, but at an inter, you know, cross, cross sectoral, cross stakeholder, intergenerational way. And I want to also say that the only way we can make progress is if we move together and we carry everybody with us in this process. And so I want to respect very much all of the points that, you know, you shared, um, especially in terms of inclusion, respect, love, uh, compassion, empathy, and thank you for conducting that exercise because until we have that spirit of gratitude, love, respect, compassion, inclusiveness, we're not really gonna be able to move forward and we're not gonna be able to do this. And I wanna recognize uh, the, the, the important points that you've highlighted about the power of, of um, the youth con constituency and also the coming together with, with you know, all stakeholders. Um, I, I just wanna say that you know, each of you in your own right is, is, an, is an institution and a movement. And, and you can imagine the force when uh, each one of you come together. So I just wanna say that's extremely, that has tremendous potential and a great deal of uh, power and goodness to offer the world. Uh, so thank you for that. I also want to recognize what um, uh, was mentioned <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, my saying that your emotions are the most precious, precious gift you can give anyone. And I do really truly believe that. And I just want to say that, you know, um, I give you my emotions and I uh, want to say that my heart beats for you. And um, no matter what, I want you to know that we're together. And um, this is uh, this is an extremely important discussion and your voices truly count. And I know as you speak, your voices resound, your message is, is amplified. And uh, we just need to do much more of this. And we can't do it without respecting each other. And uh, we can't do it without um, you know, embracing human rights and um, everybody's 
a part to play in this world. And I just want to say, irrespective of where we're from and what we look like and what we do uh, otherwise, uh, you know, and, and what we believe in, it really doesn't matter as long as we're able to love and respect and have that goodness in our hearts. And I know that you uh, ooze it. I know that each one of you uh, is brimming with it. So thank you for all your goodness, for all your love, for all that you do. And thank you for being such incredible people. And uh, needless to say, the, there's, there's a lot to look forward to, certainly with you at the forefront. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ash. It's so it's amazing just to be on this panel and listening to all of you guys. It's so inspirational as a youth myself and to hear so many different regions represented and different kinds of people. We have indigenous people and just underrepresented communities as well. So thank you all so, so much for joining our panel. We really appreciate it. And I hope you'll join us for some of our panels uh, here in the next week. Um, as we finish out our um, pop festival. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Summer. Uh, I would like to just mention to all the young panelists who are present here and also the attendees, tomorrow we have a launch of the pre uh, climate aid forum. Uh, I have mentioned the timings in the chat, which is 9.30 a.m. EST, 7 p.m. IST, and... Uh, 2.30 p.m. Nigeria time. Uh, the link is also there in the chat. Please join us for the uh, launch of the pre-youth climate aid forum. Uh, you can check out all about the climate aid forum in the link, which is also there in the chat box. Uh, it's, it's, it's very important for us to be, you know, uh, represent all these issues at larger platforms where we get to advocate for the, for, uh, I mean, we get to advocate for the work we are already doing. So uh, it's one such initiative where we hope to do more uh, such dialogues and panels uh, with other organizations as well. So Climate Aid is one such organization. So it would be great to have you join us for that, uh, for that session. And uh, based on wherever you are based, whether the timing suits you or not. Um, and with that, I would like to close the day. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow, uh, the last day of the festival. Uh, around the same time, we'll have the closing as well. So you can join us for the closing as well tomorrow, apart from all those, se all those sessions that we are going to have tomorrow. Thank you once again to all the young panelists for joining today and to all the attendees who were there and see you guys tomorrow. Thank, thank you, you and thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure. The pleasure. amazing panelists and Summer, thank you for the amazing moderation uh, and uh, Carol for her, for her uh, bringing us together to get us started on this discussion to begin with. So I just wanted to say thank you all so much. Stay safe, stay blessed and uh, stay close. God bless you. Have a good Thank day. You. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Take care. Bob. Lots of love. Lots of love. Bob. <laughs> <laughs>